Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfelt. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. And part of this series is the money series. So, you know, if you haven't had a chance to uh, watch those other episodes on money, they really form the basis for what's coming now. And I really want to speak to you about money from the book of Proverbs. You know, the book of Proverbs is a book in our Bible, and it's about wisdom. And if you, you know, want an easy definition for wisdom, wisdom is skill in living. That is, how to navigate all of the issues that come up in our lives with skill rather than with disaster. And uh, in fact, you know, as you go through Proverbs, here's some of the things that you learn about. There are subjects like sex, politics, education, work, all manner of different relationships. I mean, the list goes on and on, but one of the themes is money, and you're going to want to know how to handle money with a great deal of skill. So let me start with a sobering truth that might set the table for this, and the the truth is this. Money is very much like fire. Um, I want you to think about fire and the advantages of having it. I mean, if your fire is in the furnace in your house, or maybe it's in a fireplace, you know, on a cold uh, winter day, I mean, that fire provides warmth and makes your house into a home, a place of warmth and belonging. I mean, what a blessing fire is, but that same fire that's in your furnace, if you put that fire on the living room floor, it's going to burn your house down and it's going to leave you homeless. It's the same fire, you see, that's what I'm trying to say, but it's positioning in the house will make all of the difference. And that's what I want to say about money. It's the same money, but it's actual use and the position that it plays in your life will make the distinction between whether or not money is a cause for joy, uh, a cause for the extension of the kingdom of God, or whether it's something that pierces you with many griefs and possibly even leads you away from the faith. I mean, that's how serious this matter is. So let's talk about money. And uh, what I want to do is to read to you from Proverbs chapter 13, verses 7 and 11. And and if you know something about Proverbs, you'll know that, you know, from uh, chapter 10 all the way uh, on, you know, it just has one proverb, one saying after another, after another. So it, it might seem that they're just jumbled together. And in some way, it, that is what we find. But it another case, we kind of find that there are themes in these various Proverbs. You get paragraphs, if you will, and the paragraph begins by stating the theme and then ends by stating the theme as well, and then in between it has a number of other Proverbs. And here is, we have a paragraph that starts with money and ends with money. So let me read it to you. It's Proverbs 13, 7 to 11. It says, one pretends to be rich yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. So let's begin by looking at verse 7 which, as I've read, one pretends to be rich yet has nothing, another pretends to be poor yet has great wealth. And that tells me that there's a lot of pretending going on when it comes to money. And I remember a number of years ago, there was an ad uh, on television, and I wish that I had recorded it somewhere because I can't find it anymore. But if my memory serves me correctly, the ad has this guy, and he's got his family there as well. And he's standing in front of this palatial house, and he says something like this. He says, you're probably wondering how I've done it. You know, a beautiful house, a gorgeous and spacious designer yard, two great expensive cars. I've got a boat. I take a couple of fancy vacations with my family every year to exotic places, and we live in complete luxury. I've got the best of furniture. I've got designer clothing. I've got expensive jewelry. My kids attend the best private schools in the country. And you're probably wondering, how did he do it? And then the camera zooms right in on him, and he actually leans in a bit, and he says, this is how I do it. I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. <laughs> I, you know, that thing was just so funny to me because there's a whole awful lot of pretending going on. People are in debt, and in fact, that guy wasn't really a symbol of wealth. He was one footstep away from losing everything and being in complete poverty. 
So, so let's talk about money and let's talk about how we get it. As far as I can see, there are only several ways you can make money. Here's five of them. One, you can earn it. Two, you can win it. Well, three, you can inherit it or someone can give it to you in some way. You inherit it. Four, you can invest your money so that your money in its investments is earning money for you. Or five, you can steal it. Now, as far as I know, <laughs> those are the only five ways that you can actually make money. And when it comes to money itself and how we make it, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about it. So let's start with the stealing part. The eighth command, you shall not steal. God forbids it. So there's one way of making money you know God will not let you do without ramifications. So let's talk about how we make money. First, the Bible makes it very clear. That's my first point. The Bible makes it very clear that it is God's will for our lives that we work diligently. Yeah, I, I, I know many of you are thinking, I was hoping for something better than that. But let me say it again. It's God's will for your life that you work diligently. God has so designed you and the human race that we should be productive for a lifetime. It's no accident that there are all manner of people that go out and they you know, they work for a living and they work very hard and then they retire and do nothing. And two years later, they're dead. And that's because they've gone from 100 kilometers an hour to a screeching halt. And the human frame just simply can't live with that. And it simply dies. So listen to some of the things that we find from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 12, verse 11. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Well, you know, the world's full of worthless pursuits. I mean, you know, I sometimes will listen to just a short part of, you know, talk radio when it's talking about sports. It's fascinating to me. There are people that argue vehemently about, you know, who is the best player or whether or not this, you know, call made by a referee or an umpire should have been called. And, you know, and they're basically, you could almost see them with veins sticking out in their necks, you know, and they're angry about that. I mean, they're entirely enraptured with something that means nothing of significance. You know, there are people that, you know, are gamers and it just consumes their lives. This is what the what Proverbs, that book on skill of living, calls worthless pursuits. These are individuals th that have things in their lives that dominate them, things that are of no ultimate and lasting value. But look again what it says. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. In other words, your pursuit is the task that is before you and the completion of it with excellence. See, that's a worthwhile pursuit. Let me go on to Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard, the lazy guy, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So notice again, you've got somebody who's a lazy guy who constantly wants something that he doesn't have, and so his whole desires are sitting, I want that thing. And then there's the other person who simply is not asking about what he wants, but he's diligent and he is giving himself to the task that is before him and all of his wants are supplied. You know, that theme is also found in the New Testament. Let me read to you from 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 to 12. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Get off your duff and earn a living. That's the point that's behind that. I mean, be busy at work. Don't be a busy body. Don't be interfering in things that have nothing to do with you and that aren't your affair. In fact, give yourself to the tasks that are at hand and do them well. See, I, I think it's forceful here. Work is commended to us. Before sin entered into the world, in the book of Genesis, I mean, we read that Adam is called upon to work the land. In other words, work is before the fall. It's not a consequence of living in a fallen world. And then when we come to the end of the book in Revelation and we hear about the new heavens and the new earth, we are told that we're going to rule over the works of God's hands, which talks about working. 
In other words, working and accomplishing, it's a part of the image of God in us, and it's to be gloried in and not despised. See, and and there's a couple of things I want to say about all of this. I know we're all getting older. Every one of us gets older one year every year, and the day will come. And maybe, you know, some of you that are watching me now, you've already reached that place where you're no longer able to work. You are now retired. Now, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that retirement shouldn't be about doing nothing. It should still be about having the time now to give yourself to things that are productive. I mean, I know a group of elderly men. I mean, they give themselves to something called the gleaners, which is not far from from where I am right now. And it simply takes food that, you know, grocery stores would have thrown away, but are in fact good. They freeze dry this stuff. They send it to third world countries. But these guys will spend a lot of time simply packing this stuff. It's a part of their retirement labor that they do free of charge. And the nice thing about volunteering for stuff like that is it's very hard to get fired doing that kind of stuff, right? I mean, you're already doing it free of charge but it builds camaraderie between the men who do this together. And it also builds within them a sense of purpose that they're involved in feeding the hungry. See, in other words, you can use your retirement as something like that. So uh, the second thing that I want to say, so the first thing was simply that the Bible commends that we be involved in productive labor for a lifetime as long as God gives us strength. Second, God's will for us is that we should be influential. Listen to this. God's will for us is that we should be influential in the work that we do. And let me quote to here from one of my favorite Proverbs of all. It's Proverbs 22, verse 29. And here's what it says. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before common men. Now, you think about that. I mean, standing before kings means that you have influence because of the skill that you exhibit in your work. I mean, you can just imagine how this is true. You're skillful no matter what you do. You're skillful as a mechanic. You're skillful as a scientist, as a nurse, as a computer programmer, as an electrician. In whatever skill that you have, if you are able to do it very well, you're conscientious as well, and you're known for your integrity, People will seek you out and you'll expand your realm of influence. We know that when the gospel first came to Europe, it came to the city of Philippi, which is now in northern Greece. It was then called simply Macedonia. But Paul comes into Philippi and there's a group of women who are next to a river who are in their time of prayer and he shares the gospel to them. And the first woman that believes in Europe is a woman named Lydia and she is a dealer in purple. Purple was a very sought after commodity. I mean, people didn't have colored clothing the way that we do today. And so purple was the kind of clothing that the high-end customer would have. It says that not only did Lydia believe, but so did her household. Now in the ancient world, a household, well, a household is more than simply her kids and and everyone else that's related to her. It also is her business interests. In other words, because of her extensive business interest, when she becomes you know, a follower of Jesus, she's born again. I mean, suddenly, not only is she born again, but the people whom she influences through this very good work that she does also hear the gospel that she's doing. In other words, work is a great area of influencing other people for the gospel. Now, I have a couple of things to say about you know, uh, those people that are at home stay-at-home moms. Now, if you're a stay-at-home mom, please don't hear this as a call to leave your home and taking care of your kids to get out of the workforce. Now, you might have to, but if you possibly can, for whatever amount of time that you can, give yourself to raising those kids and discipling them and to making them all that Christ wants them to be. Give yourself to that. Now, When you do that, you can be skillful as a stay-at-home mom. You can make sure that you know everything there is about the various developmental stages that that your son or your daughter is going through. You can make sure also that you're sharing the gospel with them at an age-appropriate level. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can do to increase your skill. In fact, you know, it's been said that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, and I don't think that's far from the truth. The influence that can be had by stay-at-home moms who are skillful at what they do. Let me give you another example. I mean, years ago, I knew a man who was a mechanic, and he had an, he had a, he had an idea for ministry. 
He said on a given Saturday, he was going to make an offer. He was going to bring his truck in with all his mechanical tools, and he was going to do it in the church parking lot, or I think well, we had an underground parking lot, and he was going to do it there. And he was simply going to open up the door for single moms who didn't know where I can trust with my car. And he was going to spend the day just simply examining cars, doing oil changes, brakes, and everything else. He was simply going to do it for a day free of charge, just simply to help those moms, single moms, uh, who had difficulty in this area. I mean, suddenly, what was this man doing? He's taking his skillful, honest work in which he's known for his integrity, and he's taking and he's spreading it out further than it ever had gone before. Outside of skillful work, he'd have nothing to contribute, but because he was known for this kind of work, he had everything to contribute. You see, that's what the Bible is trying to teach us. Now, if right now, I'm gonna say this, if you're older, and you've never learned a skill in your life, and there's no trade for which you are known, I mean, let me comfort you. I mean, Christ is still able to do his good intentions in your life. But let's say you're in your 20s. Um, I urge you to choose a career. Don't let life just simply tumble by. And I have some counsel. I mean, every once in a while, I'll meet a 19-year-old, and the 19-year-old will say to me, you know, I just don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. And my first word is always, here's news for you, Bubba. You're 19, you are grown up. I mean, that's just reality. I mean, there may be parts in our culture that say that you're not, but biologically you are. Yup, you're going to grow in wisdom. You're going to grow in skill if you'll use your life wisely. But the time to choose a career path is now, not in the future. I mean, many times I'll meet someone in, you know, 25 because they couldn't figure it out at 19 and they still haven't got it figured out. And then they're 35 and they still haven't got it figured out. And, you know, they're working at McDonald's or something of that nature. And, and that's all they got. And they're simply, you know, as good as the strength of their back and so forth. And my response to all of that is simply this. Make decisions now. Make them with uh, the future in mind. Now, that might be for you university, but you might not be so inclined. You know, if you're not inclined for university, there are numerous trade schools. There are training programs that you can be a part of. I mean, you might have technical skills. You might want to be a part of a technological institute and learn a career that will help you to be influential for a lifetime. See, uh, we had a rule in our house when our kids were growing up. And, and, and if you're a parent and you're watching this, I mean, listen, ask yourself, is there wisdom in what? You know, what we did. Uh, when our kids graduated from high school, we would say to them, we want you to spend at least one year in a Bible school somewhere. And we said a Bible school because we weren't interested in sending them to a place that, you know, had Bible programs plus, you know, sociology and everything else that was included in that. We wanted them to get pure Bible. We wanted them to that first year out of school to be as rooted in their faith as possible. We thought it madness to send our kids off to university without having some of the basics of their faith established well as adults. Now, we added to that, we'll pay for it, and we're really going to encourage you to do it overseas. In other words, have a big adventure and have it with Jesus. And then when they came back and when they got involved and said, what are we, what's my next step in life, we, we said something else, and it is this. If you're involved in some kind of a training program for a career, you can live at home free of charge, we'll pay all the bills. However, if you're just gonna work at McDonald's or wherever else at a, in a minimum wage job, it's room and board at the regular price that you would pay every other place in the world. In other words, we're not gonna coddle you, but if you're going to actually move towards the future with a great deal of sense of direction, uh, we're going to do everything we can to help you. It was the Jewish rabbis who used to say, if you do not prepare your children for a career, you prepare them to steal. So here's the thing. Stop killing your kids with unwise kindness. Train them to stand with kings. So I hope you can see. Work and money and influence and the advancement of the gospel, it all goes hand in hand. So let me review again. I started by saying that it's the will of God that we work diligently. To be idle is not what the Creator wants for us, but we are also to be skillful. But before I move on, let me say a word to those that are unable to work, because that always is a group of people. I mean, you might be because of some illness or some you know, um, handicap that you have. You're, you're unable to work out of the home, and it might be that it's just not a possibility. 
I know one man who, um, you know, who has, you know, has contracted an illness that he can't actually leave his own house, and he's come to the conclusion that there is something that he can do. So he has his phone, and he simply makes phone calls to people who know, who have needs, and he simply says, can I pray with you? See, I think that's fantastic. In other words, instead of sitting back and simply wallowing and saying, you know, there's nothing that I can do, he started asking himself what he can do. Here's a story that I'd like to tell you. There's a woman by the name of Amy Johnson Flint. Uh, she lived in the last century. And Amy Johnson Flint is known for a beloved hymn. In fact, let me read it to you. It, it uh, reads as follows. It reads, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiply trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Well, Amy Johnson Flint wrote that poem. She wrote a lot of poems. And what you may not know about her is that she was confined to a wheelchair and lived her life in constant pain. And it's in that place she started writing these beautiful poems um, to Christ. And here's the thing that I want to tell you. Years ago, my wife and I were staying at the home of a, of a, uh, a single mom. And um, we, were, you know, we were on a holidays. And she simply said, come and stay at our, uh, at our home. And she said, no, you know, I'm going to leave my bedroom to you and your wife. And I'm going to sleep. I said, we can't do that. You know how you sometimes have these things. Well, make a long discussion short. You know, we stayed in her bedroom while she slept somewhere else. At any rate, we were in her bedroom and I looked up at the, uh, the, the wall because I knew that this woman's husband had been killed in a, in a car accident and had left her deeply emotionally wounded. And I looked up on the wall and there was Amy Johnson Flint's poem, He giveth more strength when the burdens grow greater to multiply trials, his multiplied peace. And she had placed that over her bedside where her and her husband had once been together. And I thought about that, Amy Johnston Flint, confined to a wheelchair, unable to move well, writing poems that ministered to people well beyond her generation into others as well. See, here's the thing. If we say to ourselves, there is nothing productive I can do and simply fall into disrepair, we do things that the scripture does not call us to do. The story of humanity and the story of the Christian faith is filled with individuals who faced amazing obstacles but at the same time, simply recognize that there was a calling of God on their life to be productive for a lifetime. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will not stand before common men. He will stand before kings. His influence will increase. And out of that principle, there comes another one. God's will for his people is not only productivity and influence, but it's also generosity. Listen to Proverbs 11, verse 24. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. See, isn't that an amazing principle? I mean, the one person is saying, you know, I don't have enough to give. I mean, I'm just barely making it now. And all that person suffers is want all their lives. And somebody else simply says, how can I be a giver and ends up giving more and more all the time? Well, um, you know, you listen to how Proverbs combines the idea of diligent working, skillful living, and, and being generous. And here I'm reading Proverbs 21, 25 to 26. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hand refuses to labor. You know, sluggard is simply the lazy guy. The desire of lazy people kills them. Their hands refuse to work, or at least they do as little as they possibly can. All day long, he, the sluggard, craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. See, that's the difference. One person is self-focused, how can I get more from me? And the other person is other-focused and says, how can I give so that other lives are benefited? Surely God has gifted me and given me advantages that others don't, and I can use what God has given me so that others are enriched and benefited and lifted rather than devastated. Now, a little personal example might help here. Um, I, 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 I love motorcycles. I, I need to say that. I have one. I drive one. 
And I've, I've loved him ever since. I first rode a motorcycle when I was about 15 or 16 years of age. I remember getting on one for the first time and the thrill was almost indescribable. And here I am all these years later and the thrill just hasn't gone away. I, I love motorcycles. Now I love going to a motorcycle show where all the new, you know, where all the manufacturers come up with, you know, this is what we've got new now. Or, you know, if you find an, a classic motorcycle show somewhere that tells us where motorcycles were once in the past, you'll find me at those things. I like that kind of stuff. But here's the thing. I can go to a motorcycle show and I don't have to buy a thing. I can just enjoy it. I don't have to have, you know, this eager sense of, man, I've got to have that one and I've got to have that one and I've got to have that one. There's a difference between enjoyment and passion. See, passion has to be about the things of Christ. Passion has to be about spreading the gospel of Christ. Passion is about doing those things that bring the saving news of Jesus into people's lives and that lift them rather than living my life to see all of my desires and my wants satisfied. The whole focus of life needs to change. So let's get back to Proverbs. The righteous gives and does not hold back. It's God's will that we should give and also that we should provide. Now, I know there's provision that we have to have for our family, and I know there's other provision that we have to have for our basic needs, and that's important. It is God's will that we provide for our own family because the Bible commands us to do so. But there's something else. The Bible also commands us that in all of our dealings that we're honest. Listen to Proverbs 20, verse 23. Unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord, but false scale and false scales are not good, not good at all. So, you know, what's dishonesty? Well, you know, back in the time when Proverbs was being written, um, a lot of People who are merchants might have, you know, a false weight so that, you know, they're going to sell you, you know, a quart of wheat, um, but you're, you're actually shorted every single time. So they're actually stealing from you. And this basically says it's an abomination. God hates stealing from your customers. But, you know, we can steal today in multitude of ways. We can misrepresent our product if you're a salesperson. Uh, you can renege on a promise that you made in a business deal. You can provide shoddy labor where you should have provided excellent labor. You can lie about a business deal. We can underpay those who work for us if you happen to have your own business. You can fail to do a full day's work for a full day's pay if you're working for someone else. You know, there's all sorts of ways in which we can short people in which we have dishonest weights in our bag. It's lovely what is said about Daniel, that when the enemies of Daniel were seeking to bring him down and they were looking into all of his dealings that he had done as a politician and no doubt his business dealings as well, and they could find nothing in that to condemn him. What a wonderful testimony that is. Go ahead, dig through my life and find out if there's something that's unworthy of Christ. That's basically what we find in Daniel. So let's sum up what we learned from Proverbs. God wants you to live a lifestyle of work. He wants you to be diligent, to be energetic. He wants your work to be a springboard of influencing the culture for Christ. He wants you to be known as a model of honesty in all your financial dealings. He wants you to be thorough in your work and he wants you to make money and provide for yourselves and your loved ones, as well as being generous to the poor and being generous in the advancement of the work of the kingdom. That's God's plan in your money dealings. See, that's so wonderful. So let me go back to where I began in Proverbs in uh, chapter 13, verses 7 and, and 8. Verse 7, one pretends to be rich and yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor yet has great wealth. Verse 8, the ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. You know, for, from verse 8, here's what we read. When your wealth increases, so do your cares, so do your worries, so do the threats against your investments, so do your anxieties. Somehow, somehow, when we get wealthier, the easy smile that we once had seems to disappear. So what do we do about all of that? So let's talk about spending money, shall we? Let's talk about it. You know, there's a number of ways that we spend money, but listen to Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20. 
It says, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied. Let me put it this way. Hell and the grave are never satisfied. And never satisfied are the eyes of man. In other words, death never says, I've got enough victims. I'm done now with taking victims and planting them in the grave. No, no, that never happens. There is an ongoing supply line towards death, and death keeps taking everyone. It is never satisfied. And in the same way, says Proverbs, the eyes of man are never satisfied. The wanter within us never says, I've got enough now. We always want more. I mean, you tell me someone who's lived at a certain lifestyle, then the you know, economy and their lives change and they, and they get more money than they've had before. What do they do? Instantly, they bump their lifestyle up to a new level. And when it, you know, if it should change again and they need to go back down, it's terribly hard for them to do that. Listen to Proverbs 30 verses 15 and 16. The leech, the leech has two daughters. So what are their names? The first one's name, give and give. Three things. In other words, just keep giving me stuff. Three things are never satisfied, four never say enough. Sheol, the barren womb, the land never satisfied with water, and the fire that never says enough. In other words, desire is a trap that many people simply can't turn off. And the more they get, the greater their capacity for desire increases, so does their lack of contentment increase as well. Here's an article that came a number of years ago in the Vancouver Sun written by a woman named Daphne Bramham. And here's what she said. We're choking in stuff, but there's little joy in it. And here's what she says. She says, we've become a nation where people can actually sell non-alcoholic beer for dogs. Now, I didn't know that there was such a thing. And she writes, which no doubt those dogs have been panting after for years. $42 pineapple slicers, which will come in very handy after Vancouver gets the full impact of global warming and they're as common as zucchini in the backyard. Then when we, we've got all this stuff, she writes, we can't seem to let go. For every sale ad this month, there's one for storage solutions, closet organizers, baskets, boxes, bags, shelves, hangers, all sorts of, and, and, and of course, storage lockers. You know, the reality is all of that's actually happening. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. Now, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we had food and clothing, with these we will be content. See, what we need to ask God, give me a heart transplant. I can't put enough rules in place to change the wanter in your life, but what I can do is encourage you to go to God and say, God, there's something fundamentally wrong. I've spent my life wanting to be a taker, and you've wanted to make me into a giver. Even the Son of Man himself came not to take, but to give his life as a ransom for many. Make me like that. Andrew Murray, great theologian, said, how different our standard is from Christ's. We ask how much a man gives. He asks how much a man keeps. That is to say, don't make your life all about what you can accumulate. Make your life how much you can influence, lift, care for others, and bring the saving news of Jesus to as many as possible. Make that about your life, and you will be content with whatever you have. Thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada today. May the Lord bless you and have a great day. Thank you for watching today. And I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.